first of all, thank you very much for uh, coming to this session. I really appreciate that. My name is Mahmoud Gannoum. I am a professor at Case Western Azir University, University Hospitals, and I direct the Center for Medical Mycology and the Integrated Microbiome. But really what's so exciting to me, and I am so pleased to introduce to you Professor Monica Slavin. Apart from her notoriety in this antifungal field, she is a dear friend for many years and uh, always contributed across, we, we say in the States, across the pond, but here across the ocean, <laughs> you know, to the fungal. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Slavin leads the immunocompromised host infection service at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and is the head of the Department of Infectious Diseases at the Peter McCullen or Peter Mac. Um, uh, Monica is uh, current uh, chair of the Australian Society for Infectious Diseases Mycosis Group, interest group, and esta uh, established and has chaired its antifungal guidelines writing committee since really 2004. Monica contributes to multiple national and international committees for education, research, and development of guidelines for treatment and prevention of opportunistic fungal infection. And it really, over the years, it always gave me pleasure to follow her progress and how she contributed to the field, uh, as I mentioned, not just uh, in Australia, but internationally. Monica is vice president of the International Immunocompromised Host Society, which promotes education and research. Please, Monica, the talk will be on new antifungals. Thank you, Mahmoud. And it's really a great pleasure to be here in Perth. And it's a great pleasure to have this session chaired by Professor Ghanoum, who's actually a world expert in new antifungals. So I'm a little bit intimidated giving this talk in front of such an illustrious person. But let's get started. So I'm going to be talking about new developments today. And these are my disclosures. Uh, what I'm going to talk a bit about is the need for new antifungals and what are the new antifungals on the horizon. And I'm really going to focus on four new antifungals that are very close into coming into clinical practice, which we use for systemic fungal infections. So this is going to be the real focus. There are many other new antifungals as well for topical use, etc. but I'm not really going to focus on those today. I'm also going to give a brief update on some newer data about the azoles and then briefly touch on some other advances. So when we look at the antifungal timeline, and this is a very well-known graph, I think over the 50 years of the 20th century, we saw steady progress and then we got to around 2020 and there's really been no new antifungal since that time. But now in 2022, we're going to talk about some antifungals that are imminent. Many are in or completing phase two, three clinical trials. And so we will be expecting to have these at our disposal in the next few years. What about the current gaps? And I think we all know the difficult organisms. I don't need to tell you, Lamentospora, Fusarium, the ones I've listed here, mucormycetes, uh, also Scopulariopsis, and then of course the, the yeasts as well. And we're starting to see more uh, yeast infections with some of the emerging yeasts, which are, uh, have variable resistant patterns to antifungals, as well as of course Candida auris. So the uh, spectrum of difficult to treat infections is really quite broad, and we are seeing them in our clinical practice. The other thing we battle with, of course, is the drug-drug interactions mediated by the CYP enzymes. And uh, again, many of these new drugs have less uh, CYP drug interactions, which we'll talk about as well. The requirement for IV dosing can be very tricky because uh, if we don't have an oral agent because of resistance mechanisms, we're stuck with using prolonged courses of IV. And of course, toxicity. So when we think about our patients, all these things fit together and all of these may be going on in the one patient. We're seeing patients on prolonged antifungal prophylaxis, which is leading to the emergence of unusual fungi with intrinsic resistance or acquired antifungal resistance. We're seeing that the risk period is prolonged and not just defined by neutropenia, 
And so we really need options for oral dosing in these patients with prolonged uh, risk for fungal infections. And of course, the drugs that they're being treated with for their underlying condition will often provide interactions with the azoles and other drugs mediated by the SIP system. And toxicity, as I've mentioned, is always a concern. So looking at the new antifungals that I'm going to focus on today, and this is a very nice cartoon taken from a recent review by Martin Hernigal and colleagues. Uh, you can see that we're going to talk about several that act on the, antifung on the fungal cell wall. And these are kind of modifications or, or similarities to the echinocandins. One is an echinocandin and that's resifungin, but it's undergone a modification to allow it to be given just once weekly. The other, similar to the echinocandins in that it acts on, uh, on glucan synthase, but on a slightly different target to the echinocandins, is a brexifungurp. We also have phosphomanagepix, or managepix. Phosphomanagepix is the prodrug, managepix is the active agent, which actually is, um, is involved uh, in blocking the production of um, manaproteins that lead to the structural integrity of the fungal cell wall and allow some of the virulence factors of fungi like uh, the ability to adhere to surfaces and uh, having a, a strong cell wall. So this is a very novel action and so this is a completely new uh, action of antifungals. And we're also going to talk about another novel action of uh, olorifim, which is a dihydrogenate reductase inhibitor, uh, which impairs pyrimidine um, synthase in the nucleus. And it's highly selective for the fungal um, pyrimidine synthase, so it doesn't really interact so much with uh, human cells. So these are the uh, four drugs that we're really going to focus on in our discussions today. Well, just to look at these new agents and what their improved features are, I've briefly touched on that, but just to expand, the resifungin uh, will be able to be given weekly, and there may be some advantage to the fact that you're getting the highest dose of the uh, antifungal right at the start of the infection, treating the infection where you really need it, so you're sort of front-loading your treatment. Uh, with the novel mechanisms of action, uh, both abrexifunga and managerpix have been looked at in combination therapy and so do seem to have activity as agents in combination therapy as well as being active against some of the mechanisms of antifungal resistance such as the FKS mutants and uh, in candida and uh, the azole resistant aspergillosis. And then uh, Managerpix and Olorifim both have fairly broad spectrums against uh, moulds. So these may have activity against Fusarium, for example, Lamentospora, Scetosporium, some of the more difficult to treat uh, mould infections. And also uh, both these latter drugs have been uh, currently studied in the dimorphic moulds and endemic fungi as well. So quite a broad uh, spectrum of activity, but important to remember that olorifim has no activity for yeast at all. It's purely a mold active drug. So I'm going to uh, go into a little bit more detail about the gaps, and I apologise that these tables are quite um, busy, but I think the real point of looking at these slides is to talk about the gaps that we see with these newer agents. So to start off with uh, resifungin, remembering that's a modified echinocandin, it really is focused on uh, candida and with some activity against aspergillus as well. And so, uh, and pneumocystis I should add as well. Um, so this uh, agent really has gaps as I've listed here with other molds apart from aspergillus. Uh, Cryptococcus, trichosporin, and some of the rarer yeasts. It's currently uh, in just completed a phase three study for invasive candidiasis, and it's also undergoing a prophylaxis study in stem cell transplant, taking advantage of the fact that it could be active against yeast, a candida, 
Aspergillus and Pneumocystis. So it's being evaluated as a kind of global prophylactic agent against those three um, pathogens. Looking at the Abraxa funga, it's important to remember that uh, some FKS mutants of Candida may not be susceptible. And of course, it's got limited activity against molds. It's being studied in refractory and intolerant invasive fungal infections, so both yeasts and molds, and in combination, in, there's a combination study looking at it with voriconazole for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. The manager picks has also been uh, studied in refractory or intolerant mold infections and candidemia and um, has recently completed small studies in both of these um, fields. But what's important, especially if you're going to be thinking about using it for candidemia, um, is that its gap is candida cruzii. So that's quite an important gap. Uh, and so very important to know, or to, if you suspect candida cruzii, this would not be the drug to use to treat invasive candida infection. The alorifim, as I mentioned, is really got the doesn't doesn't really cover any of the yeasts. Uh, it's really a mold active agent, uh, and it doesn't also cover all the molds. It doesn't cover mucor, and uh, it may be variable in terms of some of the other molds, such as fusarium. So it's important again to know what mold infection you're treating when you start um, this agent. It's currently um, in trial for refractory or intolerant fungal infections, and I'll show you the data from the first 100 patients who've received it. And it's also now just about to start, or just has recently started a phase three study for the treatment of aspergillosis, and it's being compared to liposomal amphotericin B for the treatment of aspergillosis uh, in, condition, in patients where you suspect there could be azole resistance or where you developed your invasive aspergillosis on mold active prophylaxis. So what about the cytochrome P450 interactions? Because we know that this is going to be a place where we do need some improvements because of the current drugs we have. And really, um, if we look at the um, data, there's not a great deal out there. These are new drugs, they're in clinical trials, and some, some of the drug-drug interaction studies have not yet been completed. So I think, of course, resifungin has the fewest of any um, cytochrome interactions, again, because it's based on that echinocandin structure. Alorifim is a weak uh, inhibitor of CYP3A4, as is Abrexafungurp, and probably Managerpix has the broadest um, interaction with the CYP enzymes, although they're probably not uh, profound CYP interactions, but it is a substrate uh, for CYP3A4, 2C19, and 2D6. So we probably need to learn more about the role of the CYP enzymes in these new agents, but as I mentioned, this is what we know, and none of them to date have been found to be strong um, CYP substrates or inhibitors. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the resifungin studies, just because this is probably the closest drug to coming into the clinic, and there's been two candidemia studies completed. The first one was a phase two study, where they're actually looking to find what was the best dose. As I mentioned, it can be given weekly, and um, the question was, it was it better to use 400 weekly or 400 initially and then 200 weekly? And this was, these two doses were compared to caspofungin at the standard candidemia dose. And this um, study was really only about 96 patients, so it was more of a dose finding, a phase two study to make sure it was uh, effective. But in this study, um, the 400-200 uh, dose regimen seemed to lead to improvement in outcomes in all the endpoints that were evaluated, and I'll show you those here. So as you can see, these show the overall response which at day 14 on the first graph. This was the primary endpoint of the study, 
and you could see the pale blue is the 400, 400, and the dark blue is the 400, then 200 milligram weekly dosing. And you can see that um, that seemed to be effective, um, the slightly higher percentage effectiveness, but of course this was empowered to establish that. Uh, and it was a similar finding in the clinician adjudicated outcome um, that was also um, evaluated at day 14. And also mortality, um, again, uh, similar across the board, possibly a bit lower with the 400, 200. So that was the dose that was chosen to go forward into the phase three candidemia study. And this study has been completed and some preliminary data has been reported, but it's not yet published. Uh, this was a, a randomised trial, again, comparing that 400, 200 milligram dosing to Caspafungin, 187 patients. It was for candidemia and invasive candidiasis. And when we looked at the primary endpoints for the resifungin versus the caspafungin, um, there was not a major difference between them, and it was within the 20%, 95% uh, confidence interval differences um, that would, would um, be ascribed this being a non-inferior drug to caspafungin. So there's a lot more data to come from this study. This is really only the, the first um, big um, primary endpoint analysis, and, but I think we'll be seeing this data published in the next, within the next 12 months. What about uh, abrexifungirp? Um, the initial study that was undertaken was a step-down study after treating candidemia with an echinocandin and then stepping down to the oral abrexifungirp um, and comparing that to the standard step-down of uh, fluconazole. Very small numbers of patients in this study, but um, enough to consider going forward with a larger candidemia study, which has not yet happened at this point. Uh, other studies that were undertaken was an evaluation of this drug in Candida auris um, and also for invasive and severe um, fungal infections that were refractory to previous treatments or intolerant of previous treatments. And this, uh, these two studies are ongoing, the Candida auris and the resistant fungal infection. There has been a report of the first uh, 41 patients in the um, refractory and resistant um, fungal infection cohort showing um, reasonable response rates overall um, with a complete and partial response rate of 56% uh, and 27% being stable at assessment. So this is encouraging, and I think we're going to hear more about this drug. Uh, of note, some of the resistant fungal infections that were being treated in these studies uh, included candida um, spondylodiscitis. So actually interesting to know that there may be an oral uh, available therapy for candida bone and joint disease, particularly where you've got a um, more resistant candida species that may not be susceptible to fluconazole or voriconazole. And also um, there were several cases of candida cruzii and candida glabrata with reasonable response rates. Not all of them were successful, um, particularly in the candida glabrata group, but uh, overall, for the small numbers, you can say that they did reasonably well. So I guess this is quite promising for this uh, drug and quite promising that it's an oral agent um, as well. What about the adverse um, events in these studies? Well, mainly, as you'd expect, with an oral drug, gastrointestinal, um, but generally mild to moderate uh, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Uh, so they, they're the kind of side effects that were seen in these patients. I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, man manager PICS phase two candidemia study. And um, the studies with man manager PICS have been um, really wrapped up quite quickly and have um, not all been published at this time. 
So I haven't got all the data um, or very much data at all to show you. And interestingly, this drug, which was developed by Amplix, has now been acquired by Pfizer. And I'm not sure what Pfizer's plans are in taking it forwards. But uh, in this small phase two candidemia study, there seemed to be a reasonable success rate and uh, a reasonable um, mortality rate. So this is encouraging for a larger study, but I'm not sure um, what the plans are with that. What was important in this candidemia study was that it didn't include um, deep-seated infection. It was purely candidemia. And it didn't include Cruzii infections, because as I pointed out earlier, that's the gap in this um, drug. And uh, it did include Candida auris and some patients with renal impairment who tolerated the drug quite well. So again, um, some interesting findings here for a drug that can be given orally and that um, potentially can be given to patients with renal impairment to treat um, candida infections. The other studies that were undertaken was a Candida auris study, which uh, I believe was stopped early because of difficulty recruiting due to COVID, and an Aspergillus and rare mole study, which uh, has recruited 21 patients and been closed. So um, we're waiting for the data from that study as well. But what's interesting, there's been a couple of recent publications looking at um, manager picks and maybe some interesting features about it. One was that it seemed to be um, synergistic with liposomal amphotericin B to treat mould infections. And this was a animal model study, so not in humans, but very interesting because they looked at fusarium, mucormycosis and aspergillosis. So three difficult fungal infections and showed this synergy with liposomal amphotericin B. And the second one was a finding that it was also synergistic with the calcineurin inhibitors, which is probably good news for patients who are on long-term calcineurin inhibitors. But it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting sort of uh, metabolic uh, issue that these, these drugs that are uh, um, metabolised and the act, um, their main source of action is intracellularly, may have these other interactions with, um, with the calcineurin inhibitors. So I guess some interesting food for thought about how this drug may find a niche in the future. The last one I wanted to talk about uh, was alorifim. So that's the other new agent, completely new mechanism of action inhibiting pyrimidine synthesis um, in the nucleus. And uh, this has been accruing patients in a multi-centre resistant mould study over the past several years. And uh, it was really targeting people uh, treating infections that had little other options. So infections such as Lamentospora, Scetosporium, Scopulariopsis, as aspergillus that was resistant to azoles. These are the kind of cases that were enrolled in this uh, study. And uh, again, the first 100 cases, and I think they're planning to accrue about 150 cases all up, but the first 100 were analysed, showing a 44% complete or partial response at day 42. Uh, and a good stable response of around 20 something percent. So at about day 42, for these kinds of infections, having a complete partial or stable response is actually quite a good outcome. So I think this is overall encouraging with these difficult and resistant mould infections. Looking at all cause mortality at day 42 and day 82, quite low rates, 15% and 20%. And what the key um, important toxicity that was uncovered in this study was, was a drug-induced liver injury, which occurred in around 8% of patients, or eight, because it's 100 patients um, that we're reporting on here. So 8%, and uh, two of those eight had to discontinue the drug due to the liver toxicity. 
And I think the mechanism for that is still being evaluated, but it's an important one uh, to be aware of, particularly in this um, patient population, which often has multiple comorbidities and multiple uh, drugs um, being administered to the patients. What about the other studies? I mentioned they're undertaking a study of uh, alorifim versus ambazome. And um, this started in March this year with a target of 225 patients. Uh, and interestingly, the endpoint chosen is all-cause mortality. So that's a very hard endpoint. So I think we should get some very interesting um, results from this particular study. And there's also uh, plans to um, allow the drug more availability on compassionate access and to try and collect some real world data um, when it's more widely um, available to patients who are failing or have refractory mould infections. I just wanted to show you a couple of patients that we had on the Alorifim study. I guess this first one is really showing a pet of uh, lumbar spine, and uh, Dr. Thursky's here in the audience, and I know this is one of her patients. Um, this patient had uh, disseminated Lamentospora infection and had, was undergoing treatment for uh, ALL, and had about six months of very, um, good combination therapy, what we'd usually use for Lamentospora, which was uh, voriconazole, tabinafine, and even um, some Casper fungin added it uh, as well, but progressed and required um, debridement and surgery, and then was switched on to this salvage trial. And you can see um, the progressive improvement in the um, vertebral uptake where the um, lamentospora infection is over time. Unfortunately, it was not a good outcome though because the patient required additional chemotherapy and ultimately did reactivate infection, but um, actually um, had several years of um, control with this uh, treatment. And the second patient was a person, young person after trauma with inoculation of lamentospora into the thigh and you can see the post-amputation um, PET scan showing a lot of uptake in that thigh where the, um, unfortunately, post-amputation was still culturing lamentospora. Uh, and you can see the highly resistant anti antifungal susceptibility patterns here, which is typical of lamentospora. And ultimately, this patient went through 18 months of um, treatment and finally was cured um, and healed the wound, as you can see. But it was a kind of a messy, not, not the greatest cosmetic result because of, I think, the very difficult tissue injury and trauma that he'd undergone, as well as the infection post-amputation. Quick update on the azoles. Um, just to really flash up and say, you know, esavuconazole has now been... Um, compared to voriconazole for pulmonary aspergillosis and found to be equivalent in a large multi-centre study. So we can use the savuconazole, advantage less SIP drug interactions, um, disadvantage costs more than voriconazole, um, but may be useful in selected patients and does have the very unique feature of shortening QT interval unlike the other azoles. Similar for posiconazole, large study comparing it to, um, again, to voriconazole for primary treatment of pulmonary aspergillosis, again, um, equivalent in a large multicenter study. So again, we could use posiconazole for treating pulmonary aspergillosis. The last few minutes, I might just skip over my slides because I think it's time to finish. Uh, I was going to briefly touch on new interventions, but I don't think we've got time. Very interesting um, work being done looking at CAR T cells or adoptive T cell therapy for our fungal infections. And I think also watch this space about some really interesting case reports using immune checkpoint inhib inhibitors to treat highly refractory invasive fungal infections along with antifungals, of course, but really based on the premise that these patients may have um, immune paresis or immune exhaustion due to the um, 
fungal infection. Kind of an interesting idea, but a small number of cases have so far been reported. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that we do have new uh, therapeutic options for, anti -fung for fungal infections, and they're going to be available fairly soon. We've got um, novel actions, we've got improved mechanisms, and we've got drugs that can overcome some of the resistance that we've been struggling with in Candida and Naspergillus. We've got new data on azoles that we can use, uh, savuconazole or posaconazole for pulmonary aspergillosis. And of course, we've got the prospect of some future research on improving immune response in the host, which is a critical thing, and we really haven't had time to talk about that today. So thank you. <laughs>